I would like to recount three personal stories that illustrate the essence of doing business in China. In the summer of 1990, when I was a college student at the University of Wisconsin, I worked as an intern for my father at Tyson Foods. His mandate was to sell American chicken porter into China. His, his business took a hit that summer. It was not because American chicken became too expensive or the taste was no longer good for the Chinese consumer. It was because U.S.-China's relations were running into difficulties. The Chinese custom authority suddenly found issue with Tyson's custom duty. My father told me with resignation that whenever U.S.-China relations have a tough patch, American chicken, American chicken would not be good chicken. CCP sees American business in China as hostage to be used for its own purpose. That was my first lesson of China business. Rule of the game are whatever the party says what they are at that moment. My second story, in 1997, working for an American private equity firm, I invested in a company that was building China's internet network. It was subsequently the first NASDAQ-listed China technology company. That was when I first heard of Huawei. Huawei started its meteoric rise because state-owned telecom companies were ordered by the Chinese government to procure from local manufacturing exclusively in exclusion of international telecom equipment suppliers. During that period, I also visited the office of AT&T in Beijing. They were planning to get into telecom service market in China, as that was promised by the Chinese government in its WTO agreement. After 20-some years, that's not a single telecom company, foreign telecom company operating in China today, because the promise to open the telecom market was never fulfilled. My lesson, in China, there's no such a, feel, such a thing as a level playing field. You either prosper when favored by the state or you perish when you are not. Armed with the wisdom from those lessons and together with my then wife, Whitney Duan, we managed to become business partner of now ex-premier Wen Jiabao's family. This is my third and last story, a personally very sad and bleak one. In September 2017, Whitney was disappeared by the CCP state. For four years, no one heard from her, not her parents, not I, not our children. Her phone number became deactivated. Whitney's mother, until her death in June 2021, had made a habit of calling her daughter every day, refusing to give up hope that one day Whitney may answer the phone. But her wish was never granted. She passed away not knowing whether her daughter was alive or dead. Whitney was never charged with any crime and no reason was ever given for her disappearance. As a matter of fact, the CTP state has never even acknowledged that it has taken her. I assume that her disappearance was because of the shifting landscape with the rise of Xi Jinping. She only re reappeared on the eve of publication of my memoir, Red Roulette. She called me from the same phone number they had been deactivated for four years to ask me to cancel the book release. Moral of the story, political power trumps everything else in China. There is no rule of law. Instead, China is ruled by law. CPP is above the law in China, and Xi Jinping is modern day emperor on top of the CCP and the state. Last, but most importantly, I will stress the importance of safeguarding American economic interests in this competition with CCP China. One needs to make a clear distinction between corporate interests and national interests. What's good for corporate America is good for America is a myth that has proven to be questionable. Corporate management, as capitalism dictates, is driven by self-interest and short-term in nature. The Deindustrialization of America and the wholesale relocation of supply chain to China in the past decade are a testament to that. In democratic societies and countries, elected officials should be the true guardians of national interests and the long term well being of its people. I believe it is very important to keep that in mind when you are presented with advocacy of re engagement, re approachment for corporate executives. I believe economic interest is national interest. Defending American economic interests and American leadership in the global economy is defending economic order of the democratic world.